Welcome to the Ghost Talkers Podcast, the show dedicated to unsolved history and paranormal mystery. Each week, we delve into something new, from true ghost stories to conversations with psychics, authors, historians, and the dead. If you're scared right now, it's probably because you've just listened to Ghost Talkers Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm investigative medium Lane Crosby. Here with my co-host, historian and Ghost of Gettysburg author Mark Nesbitt, and you're listening to Ghost Talkers on the ghostchannel.tv. I'm here today with paranormal investigator, author, and tour operator Ray Couch with Southern Ghost out of Orlando, Florida, and of course, Mark Nesbitt. Hello. Hello. Hey, Lane. Hey. Hey, How are you? Ray. Hey, Ray. Hey. Lane, I just I want to introduce uh, my good friend Ray Couch to uh, our listeners. Ray uh, is um, uh, founder, president uh, of Southern Ghosts, uh, and uh, has I've done a number of investigations with him, and the most recent was down in New Orleans, and we had a we had an incredible time. Ray is one of uh, one of the people I consider uh, an innovator in the field of paranormal research, and I'll, uh, we can get into that later, and I'll tell you why. But at any rate, I just wanted to. I want to say hello to Ray. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so great to have you on. Glad to have you today. Well, I appreciate it. I've heard great things about you, Lane. Uh, Mark, I, I, I can't believe he was one of the guys who got me into this, watching uh, the Ghost of Gettysburg specials on TV and reading his books and, uh, you know, calling up to New Orleans, I mean, uh, to Gettysburg on a lark one time to set up a trip, um, seeing if his group could do the ghost tour and he was good enough to come out and actually meet us, and, and he's been a huge uh, influence on me. Uh, I consider him a, a mentor and uh, a very good friend, and it's just it's amazing. You know, when I look back at the people who I know now as friends who I uh, used to uh, idolize, for lack of a better term, from afar, so I'm very lucky. It's an interesting field, isn't it, that we uh, got ourselves involved in because there are so many – fascinating people that, that are involved and the more people are getting involved too we, it, it's it's you know your track record though ray is is, is impeccable I, um it, it, t- just tell me just for our, our listeners what how what i know uh, how did the southern ghost get started well actually reading by, since i was a kid my family's from kentucky um and they were from a very poor part of kentucky they are they are uh the single room classroom type of, of schools. So I was raised with the belief of ghosts. Um, I am definitely a Fox Mulder type of person. I believe, and I want to believe. And uh, I've always just, I don't question it. When people tell me, you know, that ghosts exist, I just take it as, as, as fact. Now, every story you hear obviously isn't really a ghost or a haunting or what people think they are, but I do believe they're out there. And I just, I just, I take it as a matter of fact as that there's a sun shining uh, in the sky. It's just one of those kind of things for me. And I'd always been intrigued. Um, I remember as a kid going to uh, – the, they used to do a library thing at our school where they'd sell all the old books, and I'd find all the ghost books and read all those. And, and I got the nickname Spooky as a kid. And um, <laughs> going around to uh, – going just basically living my life and hearing these stories, I started collecting stories and putting them together. And when I found out that – um, a now very good friend of mine, Emilio San Martin, had set up a business in Orlando, uh, Orlando Ghost Tours. I uh-huh. got a job working with him, but it just wasn't enough for me. I, I, taking people on a tour and, and taking them outside of buildings is a fantastic way to introduce people. But for me, I wanted to do something more, and uh, I, I wanted to see if I could take those same people who were willing to pay to go on a ghost tour actually – inside the buildings at night, do a ghost tour during the, during the eve, early evening, then late at night, investigate the properties. Um, and my biggest thing was I had done so many investigations with people who were ghost hunters, and uh, that term covers a lot, and people think they're experts, and they think they know all the answers, and they, they will shrug off some evidence they get because um, it's not as you know, interesting to them. And I realized that it was the, the people who were on the ghost tours who were the most open-minded, who were the ones most willingly co- to collect the evidence for me. So what I try to do is take them to places, you know, sneak in, get them some history, because I think all ghost people are huge history buffs, give them some history of the areas so they have it in context, and then let them collect evidence for me. Now, does everything we collect 
prove that there's a haunting? No. But when I take a group back four, five, six times to the same location and people pick up on the same thing, different people all the time, it starts to prove something, and then I try to share that information with other people who I don't consider myself a, a, a great investigator or, or anything of those. I take it very seriously, but I try to pass it along to people who have had more experience and things like that and let them take a look at the evidence and see what they make out of it as well. Well, you know, and, and you, you also use techniques that are, that are kind of unique and innovative too. I remember at the, in the ballroom at the uh, Bourbon Orleans uh, Hotel there, it's a, you know, it's got a, a storied history of uh, the Confederate uh, officer who, uh, who, who is seen there. And, and some of our friends picked up some other uh, uh, famous balls that were thrown there and everything. But what you did is you, you had four sensitives there, and you put each one in a corner of the room and then one other person in the center of the room. I remember Karen was in the center. You've done, you've done that before, and, and you've asked all of them to concentrate their energy on that one center point. And uh, I thought that was remarkably um, innovative. I'm, you know, and, and I have to admit, if I'd have been the one in the center, nothing would have happened because I'm not very sensitive. <laughs> well, but, yeah. but we actually had a couple people in the center. We had Karen at one time, and then we had um, another lady another time. And the lady in the center began feeling so much that she wasn't ready to feel that she basically – quit she couldn't do it anymore and a lady from the corner quit as well but four corners came uh it was an idea i had been thinking about for a while i know that every room has four corners we, we always end up when i take a group into investigate a room more often than not they begin walking towards a corner um and the, especially when we investigate a place here in orlando uh, a, his, a historical center people go and they stand in the corners and they pick up evp and things and i've always found that interesting why does things collect in the corners um if we really believe that ghosts are cognizant of the fact that we're there, people do retreat to the furthest corners of the room for safety. Uh -huh. And I just feel like the energy could possibly build up there. Talking to a, a really good sensitive that I use out of, out of California, she's incredible, named Maria, we were talking about why that works and kind of stumbled upon the idea of the four corners where you have to trust the people who are going to be involved because it's intense. And you get four people uh, in the corners, one in each corner. Um, I try to let them pick the corner they're most comfortable with, and I try to put people with closer connections catty corner from each other. And then you put one person in the center. And this experiment, you can get nothing, or this experiment can be incredibly intense. Um, so if, if people do it, there has to be a sixth or seventh person who is there who can kind of crowd control because it, it, it we've had some very remarkable things happen um, but you basically see the person in the center of the room and from your corner you the only way i can think of is almost like a pitching machine where you know you load the balls in from behind and they shoot out and you just think about what's behind you as being something you can kind of control and you kind of direct it um, you can do it like a thinking you're shooting a laser beam or you can do it thinking you're shooting softballs at the person in the center and more often than not, they start to pick up on – they get a very, very close tie to whatever's in the room. And um, the first time we did it, we actually uh, – this time we'd done it with you is actually the second time we'd done it. The first time we did it, we had uh, basically two of the people begin reenacting, reenacting out something that other people had told us had happened in the room. And it was, um, it was remarkable, and it was, it was stunning. Um, just seeing how people's personalities in the rooms in the corners change, and that's why I'm, you know, I want people to be very aware that this isn't, you know, it's something that you have to trust the people you're involved with. Oh, so I want I want to clarify because um, I've heard this exercise, and I've, I've had something done like this with um, emotions, where you're you're sending emotions and you're trying to receive thoughts, but this is really different. This is where you're talking about everybody is um, is is every is everybody who's around the corner thinking of a specific event? No. Together? Most or? of the people who get put in the corners are unaware of what's happened in the room before. Oh, and they you're are, trying – They are just basically trying to focus whatever's in those corners back out into the center of the room. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. So it's the energy that you're trying to um, the focus in so that the people who are in the center can read that energy. Correct. Oh, I understand. And you feel the whole – I mean, you do feel the room change. It's not only the people who are in the four corners in the center who are affected. 
people in the entire room will begin um, – uh, sometimes they get an uneasy feeling, um, like something's about to happen. Sometimes uh, uh-huh. the room will get cooler. Um, we've had the room get warmer on one of the ones we did at another location. So um, each time is unique, but um, I've, I have to say I've done it now – four or five times, and one of the times nothing happened. Every other time we've had something happen. That's really brilliant. That's kind of like um, remote viewing by using a, a spirit to sort of help you do that at another location or something. Right, and I'm, I, I'm a big person. I used to not believe in psychics at all. That was my – I mean, I believed in them because I had seen things, and I, I'd known people who had seen things, but, you know, it's it's very hard. I, I've tested psychics where I've taken them into a room. Um, I had one real misgivings about a person that we were using quite a bit in another location, and I uh, – I just felt like there was almost a show, a performance. And a lot of people do get into this because they want to be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put a little teddy bear in a room. Now, there's never been a report of a child in this room. There's never been a report of of anything tied in with a child in this room. Matter of fact, we've never had any report of anything in this room at all. And I put a little teddy bear in the corner. Um, I did some more readings just in case something changed. The psychic came in the room and, and basically had a breakdown about the little girl who's been seen so many times standing by the door looking for her teddy bear. And that kind of just put another nail in my coffin for for using psychics on investigations. But uh, right. meeting Maria and meeting other people who I do trust, who, who, who have a reputation that precedes them, that has um, – I've had relationships with who I know – are going to tell me straight up in some places I didn't pick up anything, and in other places they're going to tell me this is what I felt. Every place isn't going to be a home run. But um, I believe now that, I mean, everybody's psychic. Um, but you and your wife are both psychic, aren't you? I mean, <clears throat> I'm, can I say that? <laughs> yes. Throwing you under the bus on this one? No, no, my, it's, it's going to come out about my wife uh, quickly. Yeah, she's, she's had uh, several experiences, and being around other psychics, she's become a lot more aware and able to control it. Um, myself, I've had things happen. I can pick up on things. Um, I, I get more feelings of, uh, I guess I'm more of a protective person, um, for lack of a better term, and I get feelings of something that, you know, uh, people I really shouldn't trust or who are going to mean, like, harm to somebody. I, I, I get more of that kind of thing, but I've had to really kind of put a, a harness on what I can do because, Taking groups into places, I can't be out of body. I can't, you know, it's like drinking on an investigation. I can't be, you know, losing any of my faculties because I have right. people who are there who've never been to the location before. Um, you know, I've had uh, something slam a window on my head one time, so oh. it, it's not, you know, I, I try to be aware of where everybody's at all the time. So I have to basically keep myself so busy that I'm not picking up on things. Now, I have seen things, I have seen ghosts, I have had feelings. Um, but the true psychics who I work with are the ones who I kind of just want to roam free, and, and, and I'll keep track of what's going on with them, and I always try to put them with someone who's going to you know, be able to write down what they're saying and, and, and keep track of everything. But I believe everybody's psychic. I mean, you know, you have firemen who know that there's a child in a building even though they've checked the building. You have police who know that something's going on, you know, that they shouldn't trust somebody. You have parents who get concerned about their kids and their kids are in trouble. I mean, everybody's psychic, but we've our generation has become so – um, dependent upon science that we don't really take into account what we can do ourselves with our own mind. We've, we, we've made, you know, I say the most important thing to investigate, I know Mark has said it as well, is, is, is you know, your own feelings and your, your own mind and your own eyes and, and, and what you're picking up on because, you know, equipment can only get you so far. And I think some people have become so tied in with the equipment that if they don't get a reading, you know, that there's nothing there, but right. we pick up things all the time, and we kind of just filter it out whether it's useful or, or, or not. And I think that's one of the reasons why children see things is because people don't tell them, you know, they, they're not cynical enough yet to believe that there's nothing there, and they haven't been beaten down by society enough. But we're all psychic to a certain degree, and that's why Four Corners works a lot more than it fails. Well, I, I was thinking about the Four Corners, and it's like when you walk into an elevator when you have a couple people, and if you notice, everybody sort of moves to the corner. Right. It's just, it's just the energy. It, it's, it's, that's where we go. We feel stronger. There's something behind our back. No one can get up behind us. It's, it's mm-hmm. still those primal instincts we have of, of survival, and I think that kind of filters on over to the, to the other side as well. And I think I may have uh, photographic evidence of that too, Ray. We, we've set up, and I'm, I'm sure this has happened to you too, you set up a um, video camera on night shot in a room, 
and then, uh, you know, everybody's packing up their stuff and getting ready to move, and then you leave. And as soon as everybody leaves, something happens. That's when it, it appears. And I, I don't know what anybody thinks about orbs or not, but all of a sudden here come some orbs coming literally out of the corners towards the camera to maybe investigate. So, you know, so that's basically photographic evidence that the energy, whatever it is, is kind of pushed to the corners when there are live people there. And and before we get off the subject of the Bourbon Orleans Hotel, um, something happened to us. Uh, you and Sharon and I heard it um, out on the uh, balcony. You know, we were the, the, the investigation was going fairly well, and, and Karen was was reacting in the center. But uh, Lane, we heard there, there's like a big balcony outside of the uh, of, of the ballroom, and it's on the second floor. And as we're sitting there, it sounded. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ray, it sounded like somebody had shoved a large box moving in, on that balcony. And and Ray, Sharon, and I all heard it. And, and we got up, of course, and investigated, and there was no box out there. Do you remember that, Ray? Yeah, that was exactly what it sounded like. Um, the Bourbon Orleans is an interesting place. Um, the the the, the because I know you collected quite a bit of EVP there as well. And right. what we're dealing with there is we're dealing with a group called the Quadroons. It's like macaroons. Um, they were um, people who had at least three white grandparents and one um, black grandparent. Uh, and what it was is they were the mixed race. And they had certain rights that um, typical 100% blacks didn't have. And uh, the people, it was under French code at the time. And in 1805, they began to have balls actually on that property. And what they would do is uh, the whole time period ran from 1790 to 1865, but they would basically take these women who were considered some of the most beautiful women in the world of, of a mixed white and black heritage, and they actually weren't considered black anymore. Um, so they had certain rights, and they would take these women out and have them go to these balls, and they would have the Frenchmen because white women weren't quite as, as available uh, at the time. They would bring these women out, and they were readily available, and uh, they would end up having these balls where they would have the, the mothers come, and they would set up with a matchmaker these huge balls to have, and they would end up trying to set their daughters up with protectors. And what protectors were were young Frenchmen who would take these women as their mistress. And they would have another family with them. Most of the time it worked out that they would have a family with them up until their early 20s, uh, and then they would basically marry their you know, real wife, for lack of a better term, and have their legitimate family. But a lot of these affairs were um, – they were almost a mixed type of, of, of arrangement, I mean, a, a, a setup arrangement. So they were um, forced into these. So you had some of them where the wives, who were also basically match made, didn't have any relationship with their husbands. These mistresses didn't have a relationship with their husbands, but the women became friends. Uh, other times you had the only real passion the guy had was with his mistress. And these balls were held there, and we've picked up on a lady named Cecile, and I know that's one of the people you had the EVP with, and uh, when we were sitting there, I was sitting next to you, and I felt my arm go cold, and Karen, who is an amazing sensitive, and Sharon also saw it, that there was a lady standing between us, and she was touching me on the arm, and she right. was trying to talk to you. Um, we have that, and then uh, after the Civil War started, we began having – they still had balls there, but the balls were um, – more white only, and we pick up on a Confederate soldier who's seen patrolling um, the outside of the balcony. Uh, there's also a Confederate soldier who's inside the balcony. I mean, who's inside the room. Um, we believe he's there for some type of. Uh, we've had numerous psychics go in. And they all pick up on a, a spy type of situation where he was going to do something which could get him killed. Mm -hmm. um, and we have these several things. The interesting thing was. Cecile is aware of the other people in the room, but she doesn't like him, and she won't talk about him. And when we asked her, um, because you were doing the EVP, and you actually asked her at one point about, does she know the guy in the balcony? And she said, yes, but she doesn't talk about him, is what Karen kept picking up. So you know, you have – here's a, a case of, if you believe the evidence we collected, of, of, of several entities in one room who you know, are aware of each other, but – the two Confederates aren't talking to her, and she's not talking to them, and she has her own little group of people. Art is one of the people who was clinking the glasses. I kept hearing glasses being moved. And, right. And uh, she said it was Art and some last name who was moving the glasses, almost like he was clearing up after the ball. But um, you know, it was a very interesting time period, and that, that property itself is so 
important to to you know New Orleans. It was the the area, the Bourbon Orleans Hotel, and it was the area of the first uh, dance halls. Uh, the the sisters. It was the Af- actual uh, black sisters who took it over. These black nuns who t- basically took kids off the street and raised them there. Children are the rooms themselves are haunted by children in the hallways and and it, it's a a very uh, you know it's right off of church property where they used to have duels and uh, that whole area there is just incredibly intense and walking along there at night when everything ca- quiets down off of, off of Bourbon Street you can just kind of feel the history just you know cover you so um, I'm yeah. so glad you got to make that trip and I, I'd hope that you can come down and do another one because I really want to try to do some more EVP experiments there. I like Carol and I. Are- <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to go to New Orleans, and you're right. And there is a feeling. I'm I'm writing about it now in my blog. As a matter of fact, I'm covering that uh, that uh, weekend that we spent down there. But it was uh, New Orleans is just. I mean, it's it's sad what happened, and it's and it's still recovering as as we all know. But what a fabulous place that that is. And we also did another investigation the, the night before. We did the uh, Bourbon Orleans at the Ashley House, and that was that was pretty interesting too. We got some. Some interesting stuff there. Do you remember um, the one yeah. fellow kept getting e- or, uh, EMF readings in one section of one room, and then and the, and then they stopped. And I think I think sometimes negative proof, if that if I can use that as a name, is, is just as good. You know, in other words, if you're constantly getting the same thing over and over again, then maybe the, maybe there's a natural explanation for it. Whereas if you, you get, for example, EVP or EMF readings two, three, four times, and all of a sudden in the same area, they stop. That says something, too, to the, to the reality of the original readings or EVP that you got. And that's what was happening there at the Ashley House. Do you remember some of the things that happened there, Ray? Ashley House is very interesting. We've had we've there there is um, at least one gentleman who who is in the property who is very angry. He's angry at women, especially, and he put some clever poetry on the wall. That if you read it down, it uh, it's pretty profane. But he um, Wait, yeah, that's right. died or before he died? Uh, this is uh, this is before when he was in the room by himself. He went through some kind of turmoil and uh, he became very brooding and. He basically carved messages on the wall with a uh, a knife, oh. and um, when you read them across, it'll say one thing. When you read it down, you, you get the real meaning of everything. But uh, that's one of the rooms. We've had um, reports of two girls seen in the room, and um, there's one um, area of the property um, which has a mirror, and I'm not going to say which area of the property it is, but there's one area that has a mirror, and people will go up there and look at it, and – if you have two girls who look at it, they begin to um, giggle. They become very um, like young teenage type, playing with their hair, very close, resting their heads on e- on each other, type of like best friends forever kind of thing. And uh, we had uh, actually towards the end of the investigation, we had a lady who is psychic, but is uh, she's been out of the game for so long, she's trying to get back into it. And she had gone up and was looking into the mirror and. I know that you and Carol and Sharon had done some research in there, you know, some investigating already had gotten several things, and uh, I had wanted everybody to be quiet because it's, it's an old wooden house. You, you know, when you make a lot of noise, it echoes everywhere. You can hear people moving around, and I had told everybody to be very quiet in this area. Well, they had gone to the one room to investigate, and they began giggling, and this was a live group anyways. And I had gone upstairs to have them be quiet, and as on the way – to where I was going up the stairs, I started realizing, you know, this is part of the thing that happens in this room. So I went in the room, and um, instead of telling me to be quiet, I just started observing them. And the one girl was just looking at this mirror. Her whole body was shaking, and I could tell by her face. I went over and stood behind her. Looking at her face, her face – I know this sounds crazy, but it didn't look right. It looked like – Something had changed about her, and uh, you could look at it in the mirror and look one way. You look at her and her face because I, I kind of get around and I look at her, and she looks differently. And we have this actually on tape, and I uh, touched her on the shoulder because I just I could tell she wasn't home. The, the lights were on, but she was gone, and I just put my hands on her shoulder, and she just falls like a sack of potatoes and hits the ground, and. Uh, started crying and, and, and really becoming emotional. So I picked her up and kind of carried her out of the room and, and got her outside of the building and gave everybody a break. But, you know, this is a place that has not been investigated. This is a, this is a, uh, this house, 
um, the history of it is is only partially known. Um, we know it was used as a hospital during the during the Civil War. It was moved from its original location. Um, you know, there was there was a problem with the owners who didn't believe they really lost it. Um, they had lost it to someone else and didn't really want to believe they lost it. And they're still there. Um, but you know, you had these places in New Orleans and. And the good thing is to find these places that everybody hasn't gone and investigated to death. And I mean, I love the Myrtles, and we're setting up a Myrtles trip for later this year um, and one for next year. But you know, these places are just as active. There's just as much going on there. But these are also places where you're not going to have other guests sticking their head in or other people coming up to the property to see what you're doing. These are places that we can have completely locked off our own group and get in and investigate. And people haven't done that at these locations. So. Um, the amount of evidence you can get is not tainted by other people telling you, you know, their stories and, and, and things like that. So, um, and there are places in the house where you'll go as soon as you go there. I can take you there. You'll get a huge reading. Um, step away, go back. You know, 15 minutes later and it's gone. But as you're standing right. up and you're reading, you'll start to feel dizzy. Vertigo is a common thing that happens there. Um, you know, people getting a shortness of breath, people feeling uncomfortable, people looking over their shoulders. Um, if people know how to play a piano, there's a piano that goes in there. Everybody will go in there and sit down and start playing the same two or three keys. It's just this is, you know, what I try to do, take people to places where, um, you know, we, we can take them three or four times and see the different, you know, responses from people and see how many are similar. But they've had in that building, they've had uh, lights flicking on and off to answer questions. Uh, they've heard uh, the sounds of uh, somebody laughing or, or stomping around upstairs, which I've heard. Um, I've gone in there numerous times trying to see where all the group is and thinking that somebody else is in the house. I've gone up and down the stairs hearing people, uh, you know, walking on the stairs, looking over the balcony, um, and there's nobody there. You know, uh-huh. it's, it's shadows, and I think you had seen one too—a shadow move around in there. It's just—it's an yeah. odd property. Well, I don't know. A couple of times, people had to actually exit the building just to take a break. I had to get out, and I'm not particularly sensitive, but I was feeling drained. You know, I was, I was saying, well, "Okay, I'm, I'm, you know, this this place is taking enough out of me right now." And um, just, and I know a number of people ended up out there in the courtyard um, just taking a break. And you know we had it set till a certain time, and then we were going to investigate a little bit further if people wanted to. And I think we were going in. I believe the time was like nine to midnight, and then if people wanted to stay, I was going to stick around till two o'clock in the morning with mm-hmm. them and let people go back and get some rest and see the city the next day. But um, we had people who left before midnight, and it wasn't because they weren't having a good time. It was because you know we had people just become so drained they couldn't keep their eyes open. We had people who just did not feel comfortable, and the group slowly dwindled away to. At the end, I was asking somebody wanted to stay till two o'clock in the morning, and I had no takers. I mean, it, you know, it, it was you know, I mean, good for me because I got to bed early. But you know, the, those properties are interesting, and 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 you know, I would love to get a chance to go back with you and a, uh, you know, just a, a few sensitives. You know, maybe next time we go up there, we'll meet like a day early and just go there and try to do some EVP without all the people walking around. Because I think you'd pick up some amazing things in that building. Yeah, I know, I have no doubt. Now, how do you manage investigation, Ray? Do you do you go in and do you set up cameras that just um, watch everything over time, and then later, after everybody goes in and takes their EMS detectors and walks around and talks to people, you just look at all the evidence, or do you perform psychic experiments during all this time while all these cameras are set up, or do you just go in and excuse me? We usually how do you specifically do the test? I work with a guy, uh, Emilio San Martin from Orlando Ghost Tours, and he is very camera savvy where he likes to set up cameras and 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 do the investigations in front of cameras and record everything um myself i'm i i sometimes feel technology gets in the way um my perfect thing is i have notepads um that i give people and i tell people to write down what they've been picking up um you know and and you get the true people who really want to write down and keep notes and keep track and you get the notes after the investigation you have other people who just kind of want to go there for scares and you kind of have to send them off to do an investigation of some hallway where you know uh you know they're not going to be bothering anybody but i do a lot more pins and paper um you know to try to catch some evp with the tape recording um i i do a lot more hands-on i try to i i'm Trying to get it where ghost hunting doesn't cost a person who comes on one of my events like you know several thousand dollars to do. I like to get it where you know because I think the most important thing, and I hate to sound um, you know I, I don't know like I'm more full of myself than I should be, but I, I'm trying to get the spiritual part of this. 
you know, we, we all go to these haunted places and we all, you know, um, we all have our feelings and we all leave, but it's changed us. We've all been changed by what we experienced. And I'm trying to get people to become more aware of, of what that change was in them and what they're picking up and, and also the spiritual aspect. What, you know, what are we investigating here? Does life go on afterwards? You know, is there a great reward for us waiting? Should people, you know, pay more attention to what they do in their life because the ripples are felt after you're gone? Um, you know, I mean, I, I kid around all the time, and I'm, I'm definitely a, a jokester and things like that, but I, I, I take this part very seriously because I've seen things happen in my own family and, and in people that I care about who, who've who passed on, who have, have you know, come back. Um, in, in Savannah, we stayed at a hotel in a Meta Bellman, and he was completely into ghosts. He was a young guy, completely into ghosts, and uh, he was with us the entire time. And we asked him to stay with us for our investigation on a Saturday night. He was there for us on Friday night, and he's like, well, I have to go meet some people, but I'm going to come back. And he came back and brought us pizza, and he stayed with us. And, and he was like, Ray, I'm going to collect as much evidence as I can get for you. Uh, I'm going to collect the history of the hotel for you. I mean this guy was 110 percent involved in this, and I hadn't heard from him um, for a week, and I gave him a call back. And after we left, he died um, oh. in his apartment of, of, of a uh, – uh, Embolism, or, or and and he was gone, and it was one of those things that affected me because we'd already had a trip to set to go back to that property, and things happened with him. I mean, it was he was there, and the hotel told me about things moving around and doors opening and closing, and that was like the first experience I had done where I didn't take a lot of equipment. You know, I took some of the handheld stuff, but I didn't take a lot of the cameras and everything, and I noticed for my own personal. Um, you know, observations. I noticed more things that he did for us. I noticed doors opening and closing, and I noticed things that if I had had a camera set up, I would have been paying attention because you kind of think, oh, a camera set up, good, we got this area covered. Um, right. But I noticed, I noticed a lot of things, and people in the group did too, and they, and they felt like there was something following us around. And the next days, when the hotel told us that you know he's been playing pranks, there used to be things he would do like hit the bell on the desk when there was no one checking in when he worked late at night to get the people from the back to have to put down their food and run out front. And they still hear that at night. They still hear him. Uh, you know, he'd sometimes lock the door as they went down the stairs into the cre- you know creepy basement, and then he would uh, wait a few seconds to unlock the door. They had the door unlocked, you know, locked and unlocked as they walked up the stairs. And so they still feel he's there. And it's just that trip kind of changed me because this is somebody who I was who you know I had just talked to just. Right. A month before, who was gone, and not having the equipment in my hand, I, I, I noticed a lot more. So I try to do more of that because I think we all do exist outside, and I think what we, you know, I think what we do ripples on, and I think, you know, if more people were aware of that, it'd be a better place. Well, I kind of agree with you on the on the equipment end of it. I've I've uh, I used to videotape everything, and now it's kind of narrowed it down. I basically walk in there with a camera, my still camera, and a uh, and my uh, recorder. But there, you know, there are times when you it it, it makes you less uh, subjective uh, to what's going on, and you don't take as many notes. I agree with you. The the, the time we were at the Lady Farm, and the um, uh, the the woman was channeling uh, a soldier who was was getting his leg amputated. Um, I was on the other side of uh, of, of the camera, and uh, I'm I'm glad I was at that point because I'd sworn I never wanted to see anybody channel somebody. But I was on the other side of the camera, and I kind of felt protected. And Wayne was in there, and, and she didn't have a camera. <laughs> it, it got kind of scary there for a while. But at any rate, the, 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 plus the, the other thing I always say is, you know, you may have a quick-read thermometer, but you know what? You also have fingertips right. and skin, and um, that's going to react every bit as quickly as uh, a, a thermometer is going to act to cold spot or even electromagnetic energy. Um, you know, so, you know, you're, I guess it's, I guess we're getting, some of us are getting to a point where it's kind of a minimalist, uh, ghost hunting, you know, ghosts, ghosts have always been, come to us through stories anyhow, through personal anecdotal experiences. And I think maybe we're kind of getting back to that a little bit. Um, it's nice to have, to have a, you know, a, have a video of an EF meter reacting and then in the background having a spirit appear, but how often is that going to happen? You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think you know, and I definitely, I mean, you know, we have cameras that we carry around with us and we record, and 
and, and and things like that. But you know, I, for me personally, like I understand there's some properties it's hard to get into. We have equipment; we can wire an entire room, basically all leave the room. But the, my thing has always been: I would rather be where it's at as it's happening. I'd rather, you know, instead of when you see something on camera, we had Maria at the Myrtles one time, and she ended up channeling something horrible to happen there. And she was screaming. I mean, terrified. She it, it honestly sounded like she was being murdered. And mm. I was actually outside the property when we heard this. I was talking to my wife and, 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 and just basically trying to, you know, keep up what everybody was doing and I I heard her screaming and I run into the room and we're all investigators. The people who were there, all of them, had done this numerous times and She's on the ground screaming. Did she let the spirit enter her body? It, it not. It was completely against her will. But she actually oh, okay. said she was. She, from what she told me, and I have no reason to disagree with her because I've never seen a person this shaken up. She said that she saw herself leave her body, okay. and somebody else was in her body, and she was screaming and kicking the floor, and it sounded. It was the most horrific thing I've ever heard. And I run in the room, and. There are all these very good investigators, very good people, most of them with cameras standing around recording her, <laughs> nobody helping her. Uh, and I grab her up, and uh, her friend Karen helps me pick her up, and we get her out of the property, and, and she just kind of collapses on herself and has to take a few minutes and starts laughing from relief and kind of calms down. And, uh, but everybody's just recording, and they, they – I mean these are good people. It's not a knock against them, but right. they all felt so removed from what was going on because the camera was there. You know, they're, they're they're not an actual participant. They're now just recording, and uh, you know, it, it was one of those things that just kind of made me realize that sometimes the humanity gets left out when we start using so much technology to record what people are doing instead of kind of, you know, taking or, it themselves. Or two, and just knowing the person, I know that you know there are many people that <laughs> that just don't know me as well as Carol and Mark do, and right. Carol is just. Always keeps a check on me, and she knows before I know practically that something is going to happen. She can read my face and say, "Uh oh, <laughs> well, it's like, it's like where this is going." <laughs> it's like losing weight. You know, you don't sometimes see the changes in yourself, but other people notice it quicker than you do. And I know that with Maria and Karen, and even Sharon, I can see. I've been around them enough, and I've been in enough situations with them that I know as soon as they start to check out. I, I can tell. And that's another reason why I can't – I try to keep what I can do put away on a shelf. And, right. uh, you know, but it, it's just you have to be able to trust the people you're investigating with, especially especially if you're a psychic because you are in such a, a vulnerable position. It's like um, the NFL passing rules that, you know, when somebody's jumping in the air to catch a ball, you can't just crush them because they're in a, they're in a, a vulnerable position. It's the same thing. You guys – Sometimes aren't even aware because the things happen so slow. Sometimes things happen so quick in the world of, 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 of ghost hunting, but sometimes it's just so slow that you don't even notice what's happening until you know it's too late. Right, but, right, and it, you know, and that's part of being on a team and and part of doing that. And it's it's a, a special relationship you have to to have with somebody and, and trust them. I mean, my husband can't do it for me. He gets scared. <laughs> he doesn't want to be there. It, it is scary. It's scary when you see something like that happen, you know. Uh, like when, when we had to rush out of the room in the lady house because uh, you were hyperventilating. I mean, that's, it's a scary thing to see that happen sometimes. And, and, you know, they don't call you guys sensitives for nothing, you know. That right. you, are, you know, you are sensitive, and, and it's kind of scary at times. Um, I don't know how many of our listeners realize it, but we, you know, Ray runs, uh, you know, we keep talking about the places we visit and everything, but the, the neat, unique thing about Southern Ghosts is that Ray runs these uh, um, uh, tours, actually. You know, we do the walking tours of Gettysburg, and we do those every night in, in Fredericksburg on weekends, but Ray um, organizes these tours of different places, and I think that's really neat because he will, you know, he'll set everything up for you, and um, you just meet him in New Orleans, or you meet him in Vicksburg, or you meet him in in Gettysburg, or wherever. And um, he he has it all set up for you already, and and the investigations and places to investigate. And that's kind of a unique, I think, a unique unique way to do these tours. Um, and Ray, you got you have uh, one coming up in Gettysburg, right? I do, yes, and uh, I know you'll be involved in that with me, which I'm I'm looking forward to. Um, what I do is. I, 
I kind of consider myself a, a, hunt, a hunting guide or a fishing guide. I, I'm going to try to take you to the areas. I can't guarantee you're going to see something, but I'll take you to the most fertile areas where, you know, if, if you do what I say and you just have an open mind and, you know, a little bit of common sense, you know, the odds of you seeing something are, are, are going to increase dramatically. Um, I know we've investigated pl- places on our own of – in Gettysburg where, you know, the stories are so thick and, 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 and hundreds of thousands of ghosts, you know, occupy these areas and you go there and investigate and I, you know, I could shoot holes through them, uh, you know, right. five seconds into it. And you just kind of realize that what's really there isn't near as, as, as dramatic as they try to make it sound, but there's so many people up there that, you know, uh, you know what you've done – Basically, now everybody thinks they can do, and they try to all go, and they want to set up their place as being the most haunted place for you to investigate, and they're right. taking these people and teaching them the wrong things. And uh, I try to basically go and know where we're going first and, and having my own experience or experiences with other people there, and then I can take you to see it. And uh, you know, I, I know a few places in Gettysburg where um, I've had experiences or, or people in my group have had, and I try to take them there. I try to take them to – you know the Irish Monument. I try to take them out to East Calvary Field, and you know all these areas where um, a lot of people don't go and, and stay to do investigations. But um, I, I've had good success. I've had uh, a ton of photos and a ton of uh, videos captured up there in Gettysburg. Um, uh, some EVPs that have been captured up there. A lot of personal stories. So yeah, um, is actually on one of, is on one of your ghost tours where every person in the group except for two people saw a mist rise up off the ground and is over by the college and shoot right up to the top of the cupola and and you know everybody saw it and wow. there was no explanation for it so you know sometimes in a big group you see things just as quick as you do only one or two people yeah well we we've, we've had a, a number of things happen on our on our tours but of course you, you know the law of averages are with you if you send people out at Gettysburg dozens and dozens of people uh, every night something's going to happen eventually but uh now you also had you were talking last time we talked you had uh some plans uh, for Vicksburg. Do you want to talk about that? Is this, is that still in the works? Vicksburg is still in the works. Vicksburg is uh the challenge right now is Vicksburg itself is a very small community. It's growing, but um Vicksburg actually the battle that happened there happened um right along with Gettysburg and it was mm-hmm. it was the really the one two punch that destroyed the Confederacy and uh mm-hmm. Vicksburg is a is a huge battlefield. It's so different than Gettysburg. Um, I I used to not be really interested in the Civil War. Um, that's my my horrible little truth. I I, I first went up there and uh, you know we had investigated a lot of places here in the South and we'd investigated St. Augustine, Savannah, places like that. And the Civil War kind of crops into them a little bit. But I I wanted to um, find some new place to go and. Everybody, I put in a poll on my website asking where people like to go, and Gettysburg came up. So I started reading about the history of Gettysburg, and I watched the movie, of course, when it had come out in the theaters. And, you know, there's a little bit of interest there, but going up there actually changed me. Now I'm a huge Civil War fan, and, uh, well, not a fan, I guess a buff, more, <laughs> that would be a better mm-hmm. term, but um, Vicksburg is a very different battlefield than Gettysburg. I mean, where Gettysburg is very pristine and very, you know, here's where the monuments are. Vicksburg, you're driving for long periods of time, and you may see a small monument, but um, there's not a lot. I mean, you can be driving basically that battlefield looks a lot now like it did then. I mean, there's just wild grass growing and the hills and all those kind of things. And one of the things was uh, after the Civil War, the, the, the federal government wouldn't allow people to – uh, put up the, the statues and things for the South. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of these places, uh, southern battlefields, don't have the same monuments and the same layouts of, of, of the more pristine and, and, and covered uh, northern battlefields. So um, Vicksburg is an interesting place. You go there and you can really feel the history. You can get lost. If you get out and walk around, you can get lost kind of in, in, in what it would have to have felt like. Um, Vicksburg, the whole city, was at one point under siege. Um, people were living in, in tunnels under their homes. Um, they began eating their horses, and their um, they had to eat rats. Um, there were reports of, 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 of cannibalism, which um, I've heard many times. I've never been able to actually find any proof of that. But um, basically, these people were living on their stomachs. I mean, they had 
had – I mean they, they would set up these little tunnels underneath their house, and they'd put like their nice china out and their tablecloths and, and, and try to make it you know more genteel. But um, it's, it, was a, it was a horrible, horrible, yeah. horrible thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Vicksburg battlefield isn't really as, as recognized as the, as the Gettysburg. I mean Gettysburg is a much easier story to swallow. The, the, the horrible bad guys from the south came up to the north, and the good guys from the north ran them out and, and, and yeah. kicked their butts. And what happened in the, the south is you know, they basically bombarded the area from the, from the Mississippi River, and soldiers were on the outside fighting to get in, and people were – uh, they were targeting civilian homes, and and people were living basically in squalor. And it it, it was the biggest, it was the longest siege um, in U.S. Uh, history. And they ended up running out of food rather quickly. They had no way to get medicine in. They had no way to get food in. Um, and people couldn't go about their daily business. So people basically lived on their stomachs or lived in holes. And um, it, that's a harder story to sell to people. So. Yeah. Gettys Vicksburg is 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 definitely a, ca- a work in project uh, progress. It's something that the city has gotten behind with us. Um, it's just right now with the price of, of of gas and things, people are putting their little vacations off for a while. So it's giving us a lot more time to perfect it. But we will have something there um, by Halloween, and we're going to have tours going with the uh, vacation uh, the convention center. So. We are uh, excited about that. That's definitely a place we want to go, but it's not going to stop us from going to places like Fredericksburg and Gettysburg and those areas as well. Great, great. Well, it's, I'm excited about it. And, you know, I have a good friend uh, who uh, uh, took me on a, uh, a tour. He's not chief historian there, uh, uh, Terry Winchell. And uh, Terry and I started as seasonal park rangers in Gettysburg, and um, he stuck with uh, the Park Service. And uh, for 30 years, and ended up chief historian. And I, I left after about six or seven years, and <laughs> I don't have quite the retirement he does. <laughs> but at any rate, he's a great guy, and 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 impressed upon me the um, the importance of that uh, that battlefield, and uh, so and the town itself. And so, if you're going to be uh, starting tours down there, I think it's fabulous. I think it's a great idea, and uh, of course, we'll support you all we can. Um, in that in that effort to, um, to to set something up because it is a remarkable town and and, and underexposed I think you know yeah. people you know, mainly because as you said it happened at, a, at about the same time Gettysburg did right. you know Gettysburg was July first and second and third Vicksburg surrendered on July fourth eighteen sixty three so you know it kind of is overshadowed I asked Terry I said the 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 horror the battle of of you know, that were that was going on in Vicksburg is every bit is as as horrible as Gettysburg was, why um, doesn't Vicksburg have the same notoriety as Gettysburg? And he just looked at me and says, two minutes. I said, what do you mean two minutes? He says, two minutes in November of 1863 when Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address. If he had delivered the Vicksburg Address, <laughs> he said it would have been a whole different thing. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it, I guess. But still in all, uh, the stories there are, uh, are 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 good and they're numerous, so I wish well, you luck on it. Well, used to have a huge – I mean they had a huge 4th of July. They had a huge 4th of July parties that rivaled anywhere, and after the start of the Civil War through the end of the Civil War, um, from that period until the end of World War II, I think it was, they never celebrated 4th of July. Um, of course not. They they had such an animosity and and the, I mean the city is important now I mean it, nothing happens in Afghanistan or Iraq as far as the military doing anything that isn't first sent through Vicksburg um, the technology there is is amazing the whole city is set up with Wi-Fi I mean they have so many things going for it and they're doing a lot of the environmental um, you know studies and research and a lot of the breakthroughs that are coming out to, for the environment are coming out of that area um, a lot of young people are moving in there I mean it's it's a, definitely a city on the rise and that's why we'd kind of like to get a foot in there now before it gets too big because, as you know, once you get into a place and start doing any kind of uh, ghost tours or anything else, you're going to have 45 people right behind you doing the exact same thing. So, uh, Tell me about it. It's a place where I feel very – I like the city a lot. I love the history of the city, and I, I'm protective of it, and I'm trying to basically – do the right, do right by them and do right by us. So um, it's taking me a while. I don't want to rush into anything, but it's definitely the wheels are in, you know in motion. It's just seeing how long we get to the uh, station. But that's great. I have, it's, well, they now, have the McRaven House there too, which is one of those haunted houses in America. Oh, McRaven, yeah, that's a, a fascinating uh, story about that place and 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 several others too. I mean, you know, um, Terry Terry 
even though he's a park ranger, of course, you know, he's telling me some of the, the ghost stories about the town itself. So um, there, there's, it's definitely fertile ground there for that. Well, I knew I liked you when I heard the name of your organization. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> so let's tell our listeners all your URLs so that they can visit your site. Well, the main one to go through is uh, southernghosts.com, mm-hmm. and we also are on MySpace at myspace.com Southern Ghosts. There's a, a lot coming up for us, and you know we we do these trips not to get rich. We do these trips basically to help us do more investigations and help us um, get more equipment and help us actually pay for all of us to travel to these places. You, it, it, it's hard to get rich in this business, and that's not what I'm in it for, anyways. So, um, just trying to make a comfortable living. So, well, let me know when you're going to Savannah again. I'd love to I'd love to visit that place and, and or Charleston. I mean, those are two places that I've I've, I've enjoyed uh, visiting, and we'll go back again, and we'll meet you there and do what we did down in uh, New Orleans. We should set up a Charleston trip together. Oh, yeah. yeah, we should, as a matter of fact. You can't I mean, leave me out of, of Savannah and Charleston now. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> uh, Georgia girl, yeah. <laughs> Savannah, is a, Savannah is a phenomenal place. Savannah, the history there. You know, I, I picked when we had done – we were trying to do names for the the organization – there were so many that we were looking at, and um, I, I get this email a lot. You know, why did you pick Southern Ghost? Especially because we travel all over the country. We've done the Brookdale Lodge in California. We've done. Um, we're trying to set up the Queen Mary. We're we're working on Colorado and places like that. And people, you know, like why do you call yourself Southern Ghost? And for me, Southern Ghost is, you know, when people say South, I think of the moss-covered trees. There's, you know. As corny as it sounds, there's a magic in the South, and sure. you know you 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 know Not there's, corny. <laughs> you, there's so many houses down here that are that are there's stories out of them. You know these are these are families that have been in these homes for or on these properties for hundreds of years, and you know you just get the, the moss covered trees, and it gets so heavy here in the in the South in the summertime, and you know. One of the things that you mentioned earlier, Mark, was about orbs and not knowing how people feel about orbs. And orb, orbs are such a tricky little place because orbs, you know, when you say, hey, I, I believe in orbs, you're going to get 16 million orb photos. And you're going to get, you know, pictures that obviously can be explained away by weather effects or by um, something in the distance that the, the light's reflecting off of, or it could be um, dust in the air or. A million and one different things, but you know, we used to, our ancestors used to believe in fairy lights and right. jack o' lanterns right. and will o' wisps and these kind of things, which were lights that that would dance around. They had the fairy circles, which was basically where people said they'd see lights dancing around, tramping down, you know, the 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 crops, which now we you know we have crop circles. But you know, all these things carry over, and and uh, you know, I've seen lights in the in the distance that are not. They're, they're, they're not lightning bugs or anything like that. I've seen, I've seen lights come and disappear. So many stories about haunted roads, which there's one here in Florida, which years ago UCF, before it was the University of Central Florida, back when it was Florida Technological College, they had done a whole research on this one light on a road out here called Snow Hill, which appears and disappears, and it's not swamp gas. It responds to people. It, it, it moves away. It retreats and then you know comes back when people leave. So – you know, we've seen all these lights throughout our history, and now that we're actually capturing lights, and once again, I'm trying to say not every light you catch, orb you catch, is, is, is necessarily something, but we're catching so many things now that we're just kind of, eh, oh, that's this, that's that, um, because we don't want to take the time to try to explain our stance. And, and the South is full of those kind of stories, and it's just a different place. And going to Savannah and Charleston and St. Augustine, you just realize how much history and, and, and how – special the area is so i wanted to take southern ghosts as kind of you know our name because that's where we're from that's where my family's all from but also because it invokes a certain type of of you know mindset so um that's where the name came from and i'm very proud of being from the south and and uh you know we've had a, a a rather shady and dark history like everybody else has as well but there's a lot of beauty in the south well, I, I think I must have been a southerner in another life because uh, I, I have the same feeling that you do. When I when I was uh, given the choice as a uh, park ranger, we did living history, and when I was given the choice, you know, whether to play a Yankee or a Rebel, I always chose the Rebel. You know, I was uh, I was uh, I just felt more comfortable in that 
slouch hat and the, and the butternut uniform, and and so I think I may have been a southerner in another life. Well, it doesn't break down to being as easy as good guys and bad guys. You know, That's why I like you so much, Mark. <laughs> 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 I knew there was a reason we got along so well. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm so glad we had you on today because I think that, Ray, you really – Stand out from the rest. You, like like Mark said, you you are an innovator in paranormal research, and we collect quite a bit of footage for the Ghost Channel. And paranormal teams send us a lot of investigations, and we really get some some great stuff. We get a lot of apparitions, and we get EVP, and we we go through all this, and it's very exciting. But your approach is is really different. It's 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 creative and it's innovative, and I loved hearing about the psychics that you use and some of the things that you were doing. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. And well, I the, thought I would be boring for the uh, the show, to be honest with you. I I didn't understand why Mark won. I mean, he's a very good friend of mine, and Mark um, is very caring, and he tries to take care of me, and he's given me a lot of advice. and And I knew, you know, I, I didn't want him to, you know, put me on the on the show if I was going to bore everybody. For you know the show, no way. But I, I definitely appreciate you know you guys just giving me a chance to speak, and and I'd love to come back on at some point in the future. And uh, I, you know what you guys are doing is so important because that's really the gateway for people to get involved in this. And Mark is one of the people who you know I would I would swear by you, Lane, because Mark does, and he's one of the people. Who, there's nobody I've never met anybody in the field. What's a negative thing to say about Mark Nesbitt? And if I ever did, I'd punch him in the face, and that's no lie. <laughs> well, thank you. But thank you. That's that's really nice, Ray. Well, I knew you wouldn't be boring. Are you kidding me? We, you know, those times we spoke down there in New Orleans and everything. Um, you're you're a great storyteller, and you uh, you have a really. I mean, you're, you're you remember things I didn't remember, but uh, about some of those investigations, and and you know, that's it's like a photographic memory with you, and and so. Um, it was it was great having you. I really enjoyed it, and uh, looking forward to seeing you when you come up to Gettysburg. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys, and I hope to see you there too, Lane. And uh, thank you. I uh, I do have one quick story to tell. If you guys would have, give me just a couple seconds. Yeah, I sure. love it. Sure. We were in uh, New Orleans. This is a Mark Nesbit story. We were in uh, New Orleans at the Bourbon Orleans, and uh, that's where Mark and, and Carol were staying. We'd put them up there, and it's a beautiful property. And uh, Karen, who, um, if you don't mind me giving her a little uh, shout out, Karen is a yeah. has a bed and breakfast there in Gettysburg. I mean, in uh, New Orleans, it's the Dauphine D A U P H I N E House dot com. Beautiful and place. Beautiful. She, it's a very small, cozy little three bedroom bed and breakfast. It's walking distance from downtown. Actually, I think Mark and Carol want to stay there next time because they can walk to everything. But. Uh, we were. She had a friend come down to see us. Uh, they travel quite extensively for these ghost events, and uh, the lady is very involved in ghosts. She loves ghost stories. She loves everything about them. And her husband isn't quite as much, and they have two friends who are not involved at all. And uh, they had come. They're from, I believe, San Antonio. They had come to Gettysburg or to uh, New Orleans, and actually fell in love with the place so much they had their wedding in New Orleans. And they had gone on a couple of Karen's tours and had. Um, so many, you know, good experiences there. They have so many friends now in New Orleans. They're back there all the time. Well, when she found out we were going, she wanted to come and tag along and do the investigations with us. But her friends kind of talked her out of it. So Mark and I were sitting in the lobby um, basically just talking and going over several things about the upcoming year and everything and um, spending time together. And I get a call from Karen. And we had noticed some girl walk by and kind of look back and – uh See what we were doing, and she just kind of paid attention to us, and you know, you kind of filtered out of your mind. Well, Karen called, and Karen's like, "You have got to tell Mark this story," and I'm like, "Okay." And she said, "My friend is there, staying at the Bourbon Orleans, and she just called me so excited, and she's like, do you know who I just saw on TV? I mean, do I just saw him in the lobby?" And, and she's like, "Who?" She's like, "That guy who's on TV all the time. He does a uh, Ghost Out of Gettysburg, Mark Nesbitt. Oh my God, he's one of my he's one of my." I love him. I'm his biggest fan. And she's like, yeah, um, he's actually going to be joining us for the investigations, and he's a, he's a good friend of Ray's. And she's like, oh, my God. So Mark and I were out front about stars <laughs> later talking, and she walked by, and she had to come back and get a photo with him and, and shake his hand. And she was so excited to meet him. It was, just, it was very funny to be a Mark Nesbitt groupie. Uh, he was quite attractive <laughs> as well. 
Well, now I'm totally embarrassed. Thanks a lot, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a big that impact was... on a lot of people, Mark. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you guys very much. I One. appreciate it. Sorry, I was uh, my voice was a little rough today, but no, it was great. Thanks for yeah, helping. Sounds fine. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on. No Thanks, problem. That's right. Okay. Care. Bye bye. And thank you to our listeners for listening to Ghost Talkers on the Ghost Channel TV. Rest in peace. <laughs>